looking back on it, it was a fun time, but it was hell at the same time. It was, it was not pretty. <laughs> What you may describe as courage, I describe as scared shitless and out of options. That was my emotion. Like, oh my God, this is horrifying. I have no idea how I'm gonna do this. I have polio, so I use a stick all the time. I always have a weapon because uh, I was no, not somebody who was gonna beat me up and get away with it. Hello. nothing sweeter than the sound of my lover's name and you know to this day still i find that people will leave me alone or they'll wish they had and so being gay a lot of people thought they were going to take me on yeah and they made a bad mistake Doing out music in the 70s didn't take any, any more courage than it does to, than I do my normal way. I remember growing as a child, I had a childhood love. Person. The first thing I told people was I was queer because I didn't want to go through building a bunch of relationships with folks and then them finding out and having to go, oh, and freak out and go through all kinds of drama. You know, let's get that, let's get this one out of the way first. And I've had many people tell me over the years, I could be really famous if I just wasn't so out. If I was going to be famous, it had to be on my terms and not somebody else's. We lived in such a bubble. I mean, in San Francisco, we had our own culture. Uh, it was it was everything San Francisco, and then the other part of it was Interview Magazine and the Warhol crowd in New York. What else was there? We considered ourselves in our group it. I didn't put a label on me as a gay artist until I came to Hollywood. And between record executives and musicians, uh, labeling me a gay artist, I had no idea. I had no idea because people were just people in Baltimore. You need a strong love. You need a strong love. You need a good love. A strong love. And I sang about my experiences and. <sighs> I, 
and I didn't I didn't feel the gayness until I actually came to Los Angeles, and then it was uh, he's a gay artist. So the labels came at that point. It was a tremendously exciting time to uh, be alive and young and sexually and socially active. Unlike people like, say, I don't know, Sylvester, Elton John, I didn't have a lot to lose, you know, so that was one reason I could have the courage to be an out gay musician. I, that's probably true for a lot of people. I don't remember feeling discriminated against because I was gay. I had always written songs about guys. Making love was my dream boy in the hall. And writing our love on the prison walls, is that all? And the next album that I was going to do for Decca was uh, going to be a New York love story between two guys and it didn't seem problematic at the time, although it never happened. Discrimination for being black is not as much homophobia. I did not get worse because I was black. That happened to me in a real great example was when I was in Minneapolis when we performed at this, this bar there and, and uh, the company that I was working with, Good Fairies, had decided to bring me out there and they did. And when they found out that I was black, they came up with all kinds of excuses why they couldn't, why I couldn't perform in the club. And it was really, I mean, I thought it was really great because whenever I say it's because of I'm, I'm black, people say, oh, no, 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 you're just being paranoid and blah, 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 blah. But they said, well, the only reason we could think of is, is because you're black. We can't think of any other reason why they would not do it. So I'm really glad that they, you know, that they said it and I didn't have to say it because when I say it, people always, you know, there's this really sophisticated racism that, you know, oh, you know, you're just being paranoid or, it's not really happening, da 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 da. And it is really happening and it's bullshit. I went to the first march on Washington. Everything, you know, I got pushed back and back behind the program, you know, and, and it was like, the people were leaving. And I had a really good spot in the beginning, but the white entertainers all got caught blonde. And Flo Kennedy told me when I got my spot, use it. And so that's what I did. I went up and I said, you know, I talked about the racism and uh, I got beat up a lot for that. In fact, I, people stopped inviting me because I start, I would talk about the racism in the gay community. And um, when, one person told me um, I shouldn't air the gay community's dirty laundry. I shouldn't air it publicly. San Francisco was a very dangerous place. And I, I try to be treated everybody well, but I, I'm not I'm not gonna roll over. And it was the same thing when I was playing music. I used to uh, use a putter because uh, I needed a cane in case some of those cowboys out there in the club wanted some, but I also had a 38 special in the back of my amp. No, I was in I was in two clubs. They started shooting. And we got down, and uh, the guy had killed the bartender, and he's just sitting there waiting for the cops to show up, you know? But we had some people threaten to shoot us, but they soon found out. I don't know if you heard my reggae song, but it's called This Queer Don't Run. The president of MGM gave a copy of Leather 
to uh, his son, and his son said he liked it, but then I was gay. So the president of MGM called me a faggot. The music business was not that different from any other business in America and much of the world at that time in terms of homophobia, in terms of people's attitudes about gay people. Sometimes it wasn't necessarily overt homophobia that one experienced, but just uh, immediately sensing that one wasn't welcome somewhere. I got the hops for a hustler. My own homophobia, uh, which didn't last very long, of course. <laughs> It was my own fears. I got away from uh, suburbia and up to the big city as soon as I could. And as soon as I found my footing, I was out. Calling us to a time of open love. My attitude was, well, you know, I'm out here on TV and the whole world knows I suck dick anyway. What's the difference if I put it to music? I thought it was a powerhouse. I thought it was really, really good. Rather than on a cassette, we put it out on a 45. And um, we had hopes that it was really going to take off. Uh, we sold them at Tower Records. We sold over 5,000 copies of it. Um, and yet nobody would sign us. Okay, here it is. June the 17th, 1976. Dream Boy. Another song written and I'm feeling good. I hope this feeling lasts. Well, we were we were on the road. We were playing, uh, you know, rock and roll music around uh, four states, and we kept reading Ane about Anita Bryant. Anita Bryant, and it was like she was going for everybody. And my lead guitar player says, "Are you going to put up with that, man?" I said, "What are you talking about?" He says, "Let why don't you write a song about it when we get off the road? You record it." I says, "That's a damn good idea." I sent a copy over to BAR, the biggest paper in San Francisco, and still is. And it come back and I'll never forget it. Conan, the over, over the hill hippie, the music is banal and inane. He will go nowhere. You know, the, who really kept me afloat was the women's community. I did concerts with them. I got um, a lot of support from them. Uh, a lot of times I'd be the only male in some programs where there were women, basically all women. Really fond memories of uh, gay music in San Francisco in the 70s. Uh, I remember playing at the Stud, and Buena Vista played at the Stud, which was a gay bar, sort of a gay hippie bar. And so to be able to play music there with this band, to sort of seize the means of production, uh, musical production, uh, bringing in a P our own PA with big clip speakers and a uh, sound guy and all that, uh, and play there for, it was like music of a community, produced of a community and by community and for a community. And uh, just so, so wonderful. There's a little bit of gay in everyone today. We 
No, there were really no other gay people that I knew that were musicians. Um, Bobby Jackson, who played bass, um, was a lesbian, probably still is. I haven't seen her in years, but uh, there were no other gay artists that I knew of, none whatsoever. It took another 30 or 35 years before any musician would dare touch me. I I went, I had another life because there, there was nobody to, to do music with because I was untouchable. Um, but that wasn't a curveball because I kind of knew that when I made the album. It was in my mind, do you want to go to Nashville, be in the closet and try and get somewhere in country music? Or do you want to be a gay liberationist and come out? And what's your choice? But you can't have both. I'm fine for when there won't be no straight men, because you all have a common disease. I personally, and it seems like my friends as well, just felt like this is the way it's going to be. We. Did the mat? We took the magic potion and we uh, transformed ourselves. We made our own culture, and this was it. Things were just going to continue to get better. It would change. There, were lots of changes. And it was a shock when uh, Reagan got elected. <laughs> it was a big, big disaster. But you could see it coming. The old pendulum keeps swinging, doesn't it? Nothing wrong. With being gay It was challenging. It was challenging daily. It was challenging. Um, to be recognized in the street, to be recognized in the clubs, and yet I had no money. <laughs> I had, had no money at all. Uh, so looking back on it, it was a fun time, but it was hell at the same time. It was it was not pretty. <laughs> For the next 25 years, because we weren't real musicians, when it was gay pride time, all the Democratic Party, blah, 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 soft, accommodationist, middle of the road types who were running the gay movement, they never chose us to do gay pride shows. They chose somebody up and coming who had a name. Well, that wasn't anybody gay. You know, when HIV hit, it really, it really, it really hit me probably the hardest because um, I didn't have a big, I didn't have a big network. But there were places that I, when I used to tour, there were places I always would stop and people would set up gates and there were people I stayed with. And they all died. Um, so it was really, it was pretty devastating for me. So I took the time off to do HIV work, which I did for a number of years before I even started doing my music again. I'm not only retired, I'm really focused on, on the music. Again. And it's, it's kind of interesting because I'm, I'm, I'm reaching a whole new audience of, of, of folks. And a lot of Afri young African-Americans now are, are embracing me and my music. So um, it's a, it's, I'm going through a renaissance and it's, it's, been, it's been wonderful. So I sort of view Gay Freedom Day, San Francisco, 1978, as sort of uh, the high watermark of 70s gay culture in San Francisco. So Harvey Milk had been elected supervisor in November, and even though he was busy trying to beat back the Briggs Initiative, which was this anti-gay teacher initiative, like right? trying to ban gay teachers in the state of California. Uh, there were hundreds of thousands of people participating in gay pride that year. And if you, as I, 
had participated in gay pride in, say, 1972, when there were, I don't know, five or 10,000 people uh, marching on Polk Street. Uh, this was just something really incredible. And so to get up on a huge stage in, in the Civic Center in front of City Hall uh, and play there and, and for people as far as your eye could see, uh, that was really exciting. And he had cocksucker blues or something. I can't remember what it was. But when the station people found out what was going on, they took him off. You know who I'm talking about? Sounds like crying these cocksucking tears. 